Hello again. So we're going to talk about scleroderma here. And scleroderma is very complicating. And part of it is complicating because scleroderma as a syndrome is complicated. But part of it is complicating because the nomenclature gets mixed up a lot. And a lot of people don't refer to it in proper manners. So scleroderma can be, as a name, scleroderma can refer to a symptom and it can refer to a, a set of syndromes, multiple different kinds of syndromes. So when scleroderma is referred to as a symptom, all it means is the thickening of the skin. Now scleroderma can be limited to the fingers and toes, and that would be called sclerodactyly. Scleroderma can also be proximal, so you would have it in the face and in the neck and in the torso, uh, but you don't have to have both. You could have one or the other. Now, scleroderma as a syndrome is referring to multi can refer to any of multiple different kinds of syndromes. So, scleroderma itself is not descriptive enough to explain the type of scleroderma syndrome that the patient has. So, generally for the USMLE, you're going to be responsible for two scleroderma syndromes, and these are syndromes that include thickening of the skin. Uh, and these syndromes are systemic sclerosis and crest syndrome. Now there's other types of scleroderma syndromes, linear scleroderma, scleroderma coupe de sabre, but you're not responsible so much for those. Those are very, very, very low yield. But systemic sclerosis and crest syndrome are high yield for the USMLE. So what do they have in common? Systemic sclerosis and Crest syndrome both involve cutaneous syndromes. So you're going to have skin thickening. Now with Crest syndrome, it's generally limited to the hands, maybe distal arms, and the feet. Uh, whereas with systemic sclerosis, it's going to be everywhere. Um, particularly, it'll be proximal. Uh, you're also going to have calcinosis. Uh, so that will be deposits of calcium in the skin or in the connective tissue. Raynaud syndrome, which is a, uh, a vasospasm of, of, the, uh, of the arteries, or it could be just a lack of diffusion to the, uh, the distal hands. Uh, esophageal symptoms, so that's generally dysmotility. It could be either GERD or, uh, or achalasia. Uh, scleroderma, of course, that's generally sclerodactyly in Crest syndrome, and telangiectasia. So the way you differentiate this is with systemic sclerosis, you're going to have more systemic symptoms. So it can affect the kidneys, it can affect the heart, and it can affect the lungs. Whereas Crest syndrome is more just your Crest symptoms. So just your calcinosis, Raynaud, esophageal sy symptoms, uh, scleroderma, and telangiectasia. And not so much involving uh, internal organ systems. So to put it simply, systemic sclerosis is going to be your crest symptoms plus multiple internal organ involvement. So all types of scleroderma are idiopathic and they tend to have a female predominance. So what we're gonna talk about is Crest Syndrome. Then we're gonna look at some pictures of the various symptoms related to the scleroderma syndromes. Uh, so related to both Crest and systemic sclerosis. Uh, and I should point out that systemic sclerosis is also called diffuse systemic sclerosis, and Crest syndrome is also called limited systemic sclerosis or cutaneous sclerosis, just to point that out. So the nomenclature gets mixed up because there's lots of names that refer to these different syndromes. Uh, so we're also going to talk about systemic sclerosis, and then we'll finally talk about the medical management. Okay, so Crest syndrome. Uh, affects as high as 286 per 1 million, so that's about 1 per every 330,000. Um, actually, that's, that's not right. That should be about 1 every 33,000 in the general U.S. population. So this is a pretty rare disease. Uh, it's higher in Native American populations.
Crest syndrome is the constellation of calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, scleroderma, uh, which is generally confined to the fingers and the toes, so it's technically sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. Now, calcinosis is not something that people may notice, especially if it's, uh, if it's very limited or not severe. Esophageal dysmotility may just be written off as GERD, uh, so that may be something that the patient doesn't present with. Sclerodactyly might not be noticed if it's not dramatic, nor uh, would telangiectasia be uh, noticed if it's not dramatic. So, Raynaud's phenomenon tends to be the most common complaint. And when you look at Raynaud's phenomenon, when it happens, you're going to notice it. And you're going to notice it enough to where you're going to think, oh boy, I should probably go see my doctor. Raynaud's phenomenon tends to be triggered by the cold. And all Raynaud's phenomenon is, is it's a decreased perfusion of blood to the, the distal extremities. So mostly the fingers or the toes. Uh, the diagnosis for Crest syndrome is clinical. So mostly you're just looking for this constellation of symptoms. Calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. And the major differential is going to be with systemic sclerosis. Because remember, systemic sclerosis has crest symptoms, but it also affects the internal organ systems too. The treatment for crest syndrome is symptomatic. There is no cure. So we're primarily just ameliorating the symptoms. Patients who have crest syndrome, who have been diagnosed with crest syndrome based on their clinical presentation, should have titers ran for ANA and for anti-SCL70. And so for ANA, approximately 90% of crest syndrome patients will be positive. So ANA is uh, an indicator for confirming crest syndrome. With anti-SCL70, most patients who are limited to Crest syndrome, uh, limited to the limited systemic sclerosis, they will be uh, anti-SCL negative. If a patient that you've diagnosed tentatively with Crest syndrome comes back positive for anti-SCL70, they're more likely to actually have the diffuse systemic sclerosis, and they just might not have those uh, systemic signs. So you want to have a titer on both ANA and anti-SCL70 on any patient where you've tentatively diagnosed Crest syndrome because that will help you, one, confirm your diagnosis, and two, it'll help you uh, see if this patient might actually have the diffuse form of uh, systemic sclerosis. So here, here's Raynaud's phenomenon, and you can see why a person would be tempted to go see their doctor if they saw this happening. Now this one here on the left is much, is probably the most uh, dramatic of all of these and the way it tends to be is you go outside in the cold and all of a sudden you lose blood circulation to your fingers and that can also uh, result in paresthesia so it's like your fingers fall asleep and that's just because you're not getting perfusion there. Uh, it can also present with uh, uh, bluish coloration of the fingers, but that's a little bit more rare. And so you can see it here and in these two as well. Now I should point out that Raynaud's phenomenon it tends to be just a uh, an entity in and of itself, not related to Crest syndrome, but it can also be part of another clinical entity. And that's not simply Crest syndrome, it can be related to other entities as well. But Raynaud's phenomenon is part of Crest syndrome. Okay, so here's calcinosis, and so that's the C in Crest syndrome. And obviously these are dramatic. Uh, it doesn't tend to be this dramatic in patients who come in. Uh, it, it tends to follow tendons. So you can see here on this x-ray that it's following a, a tendon of one of the forearm muscles. And then this is very dramatic. Uh, so... Okay, and then sclerodactyly. So sclerodactyly is scleroderma of the fingers and toes. So you could call it scleroderma, but the better term is sclerodactyly. And 
generally it's going to be most noticeable on the uh, on the uh, distal uh, interphalangeal joints. So you can see it here. And what it is is just a loss of those skin folds that you normally have. If you if you uh, are one of the majority of patients who don't have sclerodactyly, look down at your fingers and compare it to these. You can see that the skin folds are lost in uh, in, in these hands. Uh, what can happen from that is that you can get ulceration and uh, and blistering of the the skin in uh, in the affected fingers and toes. So you can see that here, and that's just a bigger picture. Of... Okay, and then telangiectasia is uh, just visible micro capillaries. Here's one below the eye and then on the hands. So these are all things you should be looking for when a patient presents with Raynaud's phenomenon. Okay, so what will you not see in Crest syndrome? Proximal scleroderma. So proximal scleroderma is scleroderma that's of the, uh, of the torso, of the face, of the neck. And what's uh, most dramatic in uh, these two patients on the right here are the loss of the nasolabial folds. So that normal fold that you see on both sides that runs between the, the nose and the lips, and then the uh, loss of the folds in the eyelids. So there's some pretty major skin thickening uh, in the face here, in both of these patients. And then this is uh, uh, patches, and plaques on the trunk, similar to what you saw on the foot in the, uh, in, in the previous slides. And uh, what, what can happen in uh, scleroderma when it's truncal is that you can get loss of pigmentation. Okay, so systemic sclerosis can have many different presentations. Generally, these patients are going to present similar to Crest syndrome, but when you go in uh, to the history and physical, you'll see signs of, uh, of multisystemic involvement. So what you should particularly look for, in, for when you're looking for systemic sclerosis is scleroderma that's not strictly limited to the peripheral extremities and it's affecting the face and the neck. So loss of normal wrinkles that you would expect in a patient of that age. Other nonspecific symptoms that you might see uh, that the patient might present with are palpitations. Uh, that's related to the congestive heart failure that can be present in systemic sclerosis. Shortness of breath, which is related to the pulmonary fibrosis that can be present, and then fatigue and weakness. The diagnosis here is going to be clinical. There, the American College of Rheumatology has put out criteria for the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis, so that's going to guide how we diagnose the patient. And it's also supported with laboratory evidence. So remember back to those titers, these patients are going to be both ANA positive, but they're also going to have anti-SCL70 uh, positivity as well. The treatment here is symptomatic. The major focus in systemic sclerosis is preventing scleroderma renal crisis, which would be a malignant hypertension. And all that really comes down to is the fact that uh, you're getting decreased perfusion to the kidneys. And when you have decreased perfusion to the kidneys, you're basically going to uh, go into a malignant hypertension. Uh, and it's similar to bilateral renal artery stenosis. It's kind of basically what it is. And then, of course, minimizing pulmonary hypertension. And that's do it, done by uh, smoking cessation. Okay, so what are the ACR criteria for systemic sclerosis? For systemic sclerosis, the ACR puts out one minor or one major criterion and three minor criteria. You have to have either one major criterion, so proximal scleroderma. If you have proximal scleroderma, then you've got systemic sclerosis. Or you have to have two of the minor criteria. So that would be sclerodactyly, digital pitting scars, or substance loss from the finger pad, or bibasal or pulmonary fibrosis as diagnosed by chest x-ray. So either one major criterion or three minor criteria. So how do we treat crest or systemic sclerosis? Neither of these can be cured. So we focus on treating the symptoms.
And with systemic sclerosis, we have possible major complications that can come out of it, uh, primarily being scleroderma renal crisis. So we want to limit those complications. So for skin thickening, we use D-penicillamine. Why it works, I have no idea. This is also used to treat arsenic poisoning. Um, I don't know why it works for skin thickening, but it works. So remember that. D-penicillamine is used to treat skin thickening in crest and systemic sclerosis. The Raynaud attacks are treated medically with calcium channel blockers, that being nifedipine, but uh, primarily you're going to want these patients to know to avoid going out in the cold. If they do go out in the cold, to wear mittens or gloves. So those kinds of behavioral things, avoiding the rainout attacks. For scleroderma renal crisis, we use ACE inhibitors. So any patient with systemic scler sclerosis should be on an ACE inhibitor. And then the GI symptoms you should use a proton pump inhibitor. So remember the GI symptoms with crest or systemic sclerosis could be uh, either GERD or achalasia. It's almost always GERD. So we want to reduce the incidence of Barrett's esophagus. And it's important to remember uh, in patients with crest or systemic sclerosis, they're actually three times more likely to develop Barrett's esophagus and therefore three times more likely to develop esophageal cancer than in patients with just regular old GERD alone without having one of the scleroderma syndromes. So these patients should definitely be treated for their GI symptoms if they're present. Uh, the treatment protocol, however, is the exact same as if you were treating anybody else with GERD. It's just, it's, it's more critical to be treating these patients. As far as what you should know for the USMLE, this is pretty much all you should, you, you really need to remember for treating crest and systemic sclerosis. A rheumatologist is going to inavoidably use steroids and use uh, other uh, cytotoxics or uh, newer drugs. You don't need to know that for the USMLE. Just know how you treat the skin thickening, how you treat Raynaud attacks, uh, that every patient with systemic sclerosis should be on an ACE inhibitor, and uh, that you need to treat GI symptoms if they're present. And that's it.